Good evening, everyone. Welcome to NTD Tonight. I'm David Zhang. Here are today's top stories. Kamala Harris is expected to be the official Democratic nominee for president by Monday. How exactly does this process work this year? Senator Marco Rubio has introduced the Falun Gong Protection Act in the Senate. More on the effort to prevent organ harvesting from the Chinese regime. Thousands of mourners gathered in Iran today for the memorial of Hamas terrorist chief Ismail Haniyeh. The U.S. has been mostly silent about the reported assassination. Kamala Harris is expected to be the official Democratic nominee for president by Monday, but it won't happen on Iraq's convention floor in front of a backdrop of balloons. How exactly does this process work this year? NTD's Fiona G breaks it down for us. Delegates to the Democratic National Convention will officially select their nominee for president in a process that begins today. But unlike past election cycles or the Republican Party this year, the Democratic Party won't be doing it in person. Instead, they'll be following what's called a virtual roll call. Nearly 4,700 delegates will cast ballots using an electronic voting method to secure a nominee by Monday. But why? Well, it's because of a potential timing issue. Ohio requires parties to submit their presidential nominee before August 7th to get them onto Ohio's general election ballot, but that's two whole weeks before the Democratic National Convention. By choosing their nominee before their convention, the Democratic Party can ensure that their pick gets onto the Ohio ballot. And that pick will be Vice President Kamala Harris. She's the only one eligible to receive votes because she was the only candidate who fulfilled the requirements of declaring their intention to seek candidacy by July 27th and then submitting 300 delegate signatures by July 30th. Any vote cast for someone other than Harris in the roll call will simply be counted as present. The Democratic Party hasn't specified how they'll announce the results, so whether that's a rolling tally of the votes as they're cast, similar to how it would have been done on the convention floor, or just a final tally, we don't know. But what we do know is that once Harris officially wins the nomination, she can submit her pick for vice president, at which point the convention chair can declare that candidate as the vice presidential nominee. As for the actual Democratic National Convention at the end of August in Chicago, party officials say that they will hold a ceremonial roll call vote to mimic what traditionally happens. And though they haven't confirmed it yet, there may just be a balloon drop, but we'll have to wait and see. Back to you. President Biden is pushing forward with a bid to cancel billions more in student debt. It comes as Vice President Kamala Harris has secured an endorsement that carries weight in battleground states. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao brings us the update. The administration is marching forward with its plan to cancel student debt for tens of millions of Americans. The Department of Education will be emailing about 25 million Americans in the coming days about what their options are for potential cancellation plans. And it's hoping to deliver that relief in the fall, possibly just weeks before the November election. Here's the White House talking about who's eligible for that. Watch major step to cancel student debt for approximately 30 million Americans when combined with the administration's prior actions, including those whose balances have grown due to runaway interest and those who have been repaying their loans for a very long time. But Republican lawmakers are criticizing it as an election year push to buy votes. A group of GOP senators introduced a bill to try to block that. Meanwhile, in other campaign news, President Biden had lunch with Vice President Kamala Harris. The White House, while saying that they are trying to recalibrate after President Biden announced that he's dropping out of the race, he is still very much the president. And Vice President Kamala Harris secured a key endorsement from United Auto Workers, a key union that could sway voters in key battle ground states. And as Harris is preparing to speak to a black sorority in Houston, Texas, former President Trump is also stepping up his outreach to black voters by speaking at the annual convention for black journalists. Here's a clip of that. Watch. I love the black population of this country. I've done so much for the black population of this country. Coming from the border are millions and millions of people that happen to be taking black jobs. The Black Journalist Organization says they're trying to invite Harris, too, to speak at a fireside conversation later. And next week, Harris will be campaigning with her to-be-announced VP pick in battleground states. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. 
Senator Marco Rubio has introduced the Falun Gong Protection Act in the Senate. The bill aims to deter organ harvesting led by the Chinese regime. A companion bill passed in the House in June with overwhelming bipartisan support. The act would make it U.S. policy to avoid cooperation with China in the organ transplant field. It would also work to compel the CCP to end any state-sponsored organ harvesting campaign. The law would add visa restrictions and impose sanctions on foreigners who directly engage in or facilitate organ harvesting in China. The bill includes a criminal penalty of $1 million and 20 years in prison for offenders. The measure was introduced less than two weeks after the Falun Gong spiritual group marked 25 years of persecution in communist China. As we reported yesterday, the Federal Reserve is holding interest rates steady, but also setting the stage for a cut in September. NTD's Andrew Thomas spoke with the bank rate's chief financial analyst to discuss the central bank's strategy to control inflation. They also discussed the impact of yesterday's decision on potential borrowers. The Federal Reserve could cut interest rates as soon as its next meeting in September. That would mark the first time the central bank has lowered borrowing costs in four years. It seems like the market's been anticipating a rate cut for quite some time. How do the results of today's Fed meeting make a cut more likely in September? The reason that they haven't been able to cut rates to this point was that yeah, we, we split into a bit of a holding pattern on inflation in the early part of the year. We had seen it come down in the latter part of 2023, but then the progress stalled out early this year. And that really pushed back the timetable to where the Fed could start to cut rates. Now that we've seen a few months of better numbers, we're getting closer to that initial rate cut. The Fed is holding its benchmark interest rate between five and a quarter and five and a half percent. While the central bank has made progress toward its 2% inflation target, Americans are still struggling. The budgetary strain that households are feeling is, is real. Uh, the cumulative effect of inflation uh, means that household expenses are 20, 25, 30% higher than they were four years ago. Income may or may not have kept up with that, but, but people certainly don't have more buying power now than they did, say, four or five years ago. So what should potential borrowers take away from the Fed's meeting today? The key takeaway is this. Interest rates took the elevator going up, but they're going to take the stairs coming down interest rates are going to come down a lot more slowly than what we saw when they were going up. And so don't expect an immediate windfall in terms of lower borrowing costs. Do you have any advice for consumers and Americans who are still struggling with high prices, still struggling to get a loan, whether that's for a home or a car? The best thing to, to do is, is make sure that you are on a solid financial foundation. From a credit perspective, you want to be paying down and paying off debt uh, you want to make sure that you're paying all your obligations on time. Uh, that's those are that together is really two thirds of your credit score right there. The better your credit rating, the better position you put yourself in to qualify for the most competitive rates, regardless of the interest rate environment. The Fed will hold its next meeting on September 17th, just seven weeks before the November elections. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. The U.S. has been mostly silent about the reported assassination of a top Hamas leader in Iran. Thousands of mourners gathered in Iran today for the memorial of Hamas terrorist chief Ismail Haniya. Thousands gathered in Tehran for Hamas chief Ismail Haniya's memorial service earlier today. Iran's supreme leader led a prayer service for the slain terrorist leader while crowds grieved. A Hamas spokesman said Haniya was hit directly by a rocket in his residence and vowed revenge for his death. In Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned of Iran's axis of evil, calling it an existential war against terrorist armies, Hamas, Houthis, and Hezbollah. In the last few days, we have dealt a crushing blow to each of them. Meanwhile, in the U.S., the Biden administration is urging restraint from all parties in hopes of preventing wider escalation. I'm not in a position to confirm the reports coming out of Tehran. I've seen the statement that Hamas put out. I can't confirm or, or verify. We have no independent confirmation. The White House says reports of Hania's assassination in Iran don't help bring the temperature down. The administration is repeating calls for a ceasefire deal that would free remaining hostages from Hamas. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the U.S. was not made aware of or involved in the killing of the terrorist chief. I've learned uh, over many years never to speculate on the, the impact one event may have on, on something else. Blinken says the best way to bring the temperature down everywhere is through a Gaza ceasefire deal. Hania was a top negotiator for Hamas in ceasefire talks. Well, that will have 
I think, important uh, effects on other areas where you could see conflict, whether it's in the north of Israel and, and Lebanon, whether it's Iran, uh, whether it's in the Red Sea uh, with the Houthis. Uh, so that's why that the focus on the ceasefire needs to remain. The State Department says the U.S. is ready to take every possible measure to protect U.S. troops in the Middle East. Protect our personnel, our interests um, uh, in the region and beyond uh, should we need to. The State Department is warning American citizens in southern Lebanon to leave. It raised travel advisory to level four yesterday, telling people to be prepared to shelter in place if the situation deteriorates. This comes after Israel killed one of Hezbollah's top commanders with a strike in Beirut Tuesday night. Anyone with plans to travel to the region might want to check their tickets. United and Delta Airlines are cancelling flights to Tel Aviv. Delta has cancelled flights through Friday, citing conflict in the region. United cancelled its daily flight and didn't give a timeline on when it might resume. Both airlines say they are watching the situation closely. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. We'll take a short break now, everybody, but here's a look at what we have for you when we come back. Firefighters are working hard to contain wildfires raging across Colorado and Northern California. We have the latest as we continue to monitor the blazes. 14 sex buyers were arrested in a human trafficking sting operation at San Diego's popular comic convention. Carol Damkowski has been a vintage enthusiast since childhood. She tells NTD why she's continuing this path after rent has doubled. Those stories and more coming up on NTD Tonight. Welcome back to NTD Tonight. I'm your host, David Zhang. Firefighters are working hard to contain wildfires raging across Colorado's Front Range and in Northern California. The fire in Colorado has killed one person. NTD's Christina Corona provides the latest updates on the blazes. The Alexander Mountain Fire, burning near Loveland in northern Colorado since Monday, has grown to 7,648 acres. According to the U.S. Forest Service, the fire is 1% contained as of Thursday morning. Several road closures and mandatory evacuations are in place as crews continue to battle the blaze. Despite the hot, dry and windy weather forecasted for the area on Thursday and Friday, the U.S. Forest Service mentioned a slight chance of scattered rain over the weekend in its Wednesday evening update. As of Thursday morning, the cause of the fire has not yet been determined. In Northern California, the Park Fire has burned 391,200 acres and is 18 percent contained as of Thursday morning. It's now the fifth largest fire in California history. First responder therapy dogs have been brought in to boost the spirits of firefighters battling the park fire. Local authorities said the three therapy dogs recently arrived at a base camp in Butte County. Cal Fire shared videos and images on X. We are here to help the humans with their mental health while assigned to the incident and away from their other humans and fur friends. The park fire is one of more than 100 large active wildfires currently burning across the United States. Christina Corona, NTD News. Amidst the wildfire season on the West Coast, researchers are studying how fires contaminate water. Structures damaged from fires can get into runoff that pollute the surrounding water, rendering them undrinkable. A researcher explains. Lauren Mayazzi is a PhD student of the Civil, Environmental and Architectural Engineering Department at the University of Colorado Boulder. Mayazzi's research interests are in fire at the wildland urban interface and the contamination risk to surface areas. What wildfires do, first and foremost, you can imagine, is that they burn vegetation. And so when this vegetation is combusted, uh, you know, vegetation stabilizes our stream banks. And when we remove that stabilization, a lot of sediment can move into streams. So we get this huge pulse of sediment. And in addition to that, the combusted vegetation, it releases nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon, uh, which then enters the stream as well. And this can be a beneficial process. Uh, it's not always a negative process, but it can also also lead to things like flooding uh, and debris flow, mudslides. 
When she and fellow researchers were studying the impacts of California's 2018 campfire, they found more metals like zinc, copper, lead, nickel, and chemicals from homes and vehicles that flow through storm drains and right into the water. Urban conflagrations are not beneficial uh, to our ecosystems. Uh, in these cases, the fuels are very different. So like you can imagine, rather than the fuels being dominantly vegetation, the fuels are homes, vehicles, garbage, anything you might keep in your garage, chemicals. Uh, and what's also different about urban conflagrations is the surface is impervious surface area. So we have these hydrologically efficient gutters uh, and storm drains that funnel those complex contaminants right into our surface water. She explains that when water quality gets impaired over time, it becomes harder for water treatment plants to create safe drinking water. In the case of the 2018 campfire, officials and experts thought it was okay to drink water after boiling, but discovered two weeks later it was still contaminated with benzene. Two months after that, the public was informed the water was unsafe and warned not to try to treat it on their own. Multiple victims were rescued in a human trafficking sting operation during San Diego's Comic-Con, and authorities arrested more than a dozen individuals. NTD's Christina Corona has the details. California Attorney General Rob Bonta announced on Tuesday authorities arrested 14 people and rescued 10 victims in a major human trafficking sting at the San Diego Comic-Con convention. The operation, conducted from July 25th through 27th at the star-studded convention in downtown San Diego, involved local and state task force officers. Law enforcement personnel posed as sex buyers to identify and contact potential trafficking victims and arrest their traffickers. They also posted undercover ads soliciting sex. San Diego Sheriff Kelly Martinez said in a press release, there is no more insidious crime than human trafficking. The coercion and violence which enslaves people for profit and places them into forced labor or sex is criminal. As the sheriff, I support the efforts of all our justice partners in holding perpetrators accountable. I appreciate the focus that was placed on the recent convention to identify and rescue victims of human trafficking. The age of the victims were not disclosed. The Comic-Con International Convention draws over 130,000 fans annually. Christina Corona, NTD News. It's the art to bring life back into vintage items. One business owner has been doing this for over 16 years and now doing the same for her store in Silicon Valley. She said her rent has doubled. NTD's David Lamb has the story. It's been real bittersweet. She's built relations with customers over the last 16 years in a charming district of San Jose, California. I've watched children grow up into young adults that bought maybe a purse or a necklace and still used it when they went to their senior prom. Carol Dimkowski runs the Three Sisters Antique Store. She had a big closing sale recently, but it's not goodbye for good only relocating to another part of the valley. 76-year-old Dimkowski said her rent doubled here. It, it is a good time for a new, a new start. She's set to have a spot to sell her antiques at Montebello Road Vintage Store. That's in the neighboring city, Campbell. The fact that the rent went up was the deciding factor to close. And once that decision was made, there, there was no turning back. I mean, what can you do? You just pack everything up and decide what you're going to do in the next leg of the story, ongoing story of Three Sisters. The Three Sisters opened in 2008. I'm about 90% vintage, but I always knew that I had to be like a emporium and offer different things. A lot of people just don't want collectibles or antiques. To appeal to customers, she also carries hit items like local honey made from a resident beekeeper who happens to be her husband. I carry oil cloth, which was originally made back in the 30s and 40s. It's being still made today, and it's like a vinyl material that people can cover tablecloths or use on chairs. Dimkowski was born in 1948 in Japan. And at a young age, she found a liking to antiques. Just wait for that feeling, that idea to hit. And when I see something, it just draws me in. And then, of course, if it's painted green, that's the... I love any color green. For the next chapter, 
Dimkowski has hope. Just that I can continue doing what I love, which is picking up merchandise that needs sometimes a little loving care of uh, repairs to the wood or reupholstering the fabrics or painting or and then selling. That's what I love. In San Jose, California, David Lamb, NTD News. Stay tuned for China in Focus with Tiffany Meyer coming up next. Mountain landslides submerged the houses and flooded farmlands. A look at the aftermath in China's flood-hit regions. More on China in Focus with Tiffany Meyer at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. And that's all we've got for you tonight. We'd like to thank you for joining us on NTD Tonight every weekday at 9 p.m. Our show is coming to a close tomorrow, August 2nd. But NTD still has plenty of informative shows and on-the-ground news coverage airing across our network. For more information, please visit NTD.com. I'm David Zhang. Have a wonderful evening.